Good morning. This is the Keeping It Real Sunday School class from Cornerstone Baptist Church in Richland, Missouri. We're going to be studying today about the Olivet Discourse. I mentioned a little bit about that on our last week's lesson. John doesn't have near as much in there about the end times uh, predictions that Christ made as Matthew. and So we're going to be looking today at Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to look about a very interesting subject concerning the end times, the time prior to Christ coming in His power and in His glory. So, Brenda, I would ask you to read um, Matthew 24, verse 3 through 8. And as He sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto Him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of Thy coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. And these are... All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now I'm reminded when we look at these verses, Brenda, about our lesson at Christmas time, about the concept of peace on earth, that when Christ came, uh, the angels sang out, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And that peace was between God and man through the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. There's not ever going to be any peace between men. Apparently not. <laughs> There's not going to be any peace on the earth. Uh, there's a, a very good uh, prophecy concerning that subject. Right up until the end of time, there's going to be wars and rumors and wars and pestilences and earthquakes and all kinds of dire consequences. Um, the Bible tells us that before Christ comes, it's going to get worse instead of better. It's going to be actually, Jesus said, as it was in the time of Noah. Mm-hmm. People are going to be going about their life like normal, but they're going to be completely uh, focused on themselves, and suddenly the judgment of God shall come. So I wanted to address a couple of uh, different things here. Turn to Zechariah, Brenda, if you will, uh, in the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Now, I've not done a thorough study of Zechariah, but this is a verse that relates to the end of time. Tell me what chapter again? Uh, 14, verse 4. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in its midst toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley. And half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Now, <clears throat> the Mount of Olives... We think a mount, we think something like Pike's Peak or Mount Olympias or something like that. Mm -hmm. This is a hill. There are mm -hmm. seven hills there in Jerusalem, and this is one of them on the east side, and it's called the Mount of Olives because it's where they grew olives, olive trees all over it. The Garden of Gethsemane is at the base, or just starting up, the Mount of Olives, where Christ was the night that he was taken into captivity and then put before the false trials of the Sanhedrin and Herod and... Um, this has a lot of prominence. You understand that Jerusalem is probably the most important piece of real estate in the world. There is a portal between heaven uh, and earth at uh, Jerusalem. It's where Jacob um, saw angels going up and down through heaven on Jacob's ladder. It is where Jacob uh, wrestled with Christ. It's where Abraham took Isaac to be um, sacrificed, and we think right on the exact same place that Jesus was sacrificed. Um, very important piece of real estate. During the time of Ezekiel, when God was preparing for Nebuchadnezzar to come and punish the nation of Judah and Benjamin, the nations of Judah and Benjamin, he'd already took out the ten tribes in the northern kingdom, um, Ezekiel has a vision of the glory of God being removed from over the Ark of the Covenant and coming up into the air 
and you have this phenomenal vision of what's happening, the cherubims, and that glory of God settling down on the Mount Olives. Mount Olives has a great significance. Um, you find here in Zechariah where when Christ comes, where is He going to come to? The Mount Olives. When Christ ascended into heaven, where did He send from? From the Mount the Olives. Olives. Uh, you remember the angel said, While you look up here and gaze, this, this very same manner shall Christ return. And so it's a very important piece of real estate. And when his foot touches the ground, it says, the Mount of Olives is going to split in two. Mm -hmm. going to be a great cataclysmic event, which Christ is going to uh, address a little bit later in this um, Olivet Discourse. Christ is trying to prepare the disciples for the fact that there is going to be a lot of false teachers, false prophets, false Jesuses in the future, that we should not be surprised when someone claims to be Jesus or claims to have some uh, insight into what God is going to do. We've had numerous instances, Brenda, in the last 30 years of people predicting when Christ is going to come. People have sold mm -hmm. all their property, gone gathered on some spot, waiting for Christ to return to, to be sorely disappointed. Mm -hmm. The Bible tells us that no one knows the time nor the hour except the Father, not even the Son. Jesus has not uh, set that time. He is going to abide by that time. Just as He fulfilled time, uh, when he was born and when he was uh, crucified and when he rose from the dead, from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Um, lots of places, it says, there is going to be famines and pestilences and earthquake, earthquakes. And he says, you're going to know that this is the beginning of sorrows. That's, uh, that's a way to say it's the beginning of labor pains for a woman. Uh, you know birth is imminent, don't you, Brenda, when the labor pains start? Uh, yes, unless there are those darn false ones. Now you can have false ones, but they're not the same. No, they're not the same. When labor pains start, you know it's going to be a birth. going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's what he is using. That's what he means by the beginning of sorrows. It's uh, just like a lady giving birth. Um, it's going to, it's, uh, you know, next several hours, we're going to have a new baby. And Brenda, would you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and I would like to you to read um, verse 16, please. Second Samuel 7, 16. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Now this is Samuel prophesying to, that the throne of David shall endure forever. The Lord Jesus Christ is the son of David. He shall sit on the throne in Jerusalem at the millennial period of time and for eternity thereon uh, as the king of the world taking over King David's throne mm -hmm. because he is of the lineage of David. Mm -hmm. um, not only on his mother's side, but on his earthly father's side, Joseph's side. So he has a claim to it from both directions, even though he's Joseph's stepson. Um, this is a pretty important part of Scripture because it tells us, as, as uh, Jesus is is giving this all of that discourse that even though all these things are going to happen, the end result is that when Christ returns, he is going to become uh, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's going to be written on his thigh with his vesture dripped in blood. It's his blood it's dripped in, his own blood, Jesus' blood. Um, his blood is what provides us salvation and protection against the wrath of God against sin. It reminds us, because he is of the lineage of David, and because we have scriptures like this, that we can hold fast to what the truth of the Word is. Christ is coming back. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when he comes back, he's going to come back as a ruler, mm -hmm. as a king, a king of kings, and lord of lords, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Um, these scriptures all are going to point us to that particular time, when everything comes together in the fullness of time. 
So, Brandon, would you drop down in Matthew 24 and read verse 29 through 32, please? Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, the Son of Man is a term we see utilized in Daniel to describe the Messiah. It is the term that Jesus used to refer to himself most commonly in the Scripture. Son of Man. Uh, he was 100% man and 100% God, but uh, he, used, he chose that term to represent who he was because it's a term that Daniel utilized to define uh, the coming of the Messiah. And particularly in Daniel chapter 7, we see many of the things that are described here uh, described in Daniel chapter 7. He's going to come in the clouds of heaven and with power and great glory. Now, why does it say, do you think, that the tribes of the earth mourn? Why in the world would we mourn when Jesus is coming? What tribes is he talking about? What kind of people are going to mourn when they see Christ coming in the air? Uh, probably the unsaved. The unsaved. Yeah. Because it's over. Mm -hmm. It's done. Yeah. Judgment is nigh, saith mm -hmm. the Lord. A judgment has come. It's too late to make a decision. It's too late to turn. It's too late to repent. Mm -hmm. It's too late, too late to take Jesus. It's over. Mm -hmm. And that is what he's referring to. There are going to be people that are going to have put all of this off in their life. And the imminence of Christ's coming is supposed to be something that drives us to understand we need to make the decision today. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans that today is the day of salvation, right? Don't put it off. Don't wait. It could happen any moment. We are to have a attitude of expectancy, correct? Mm -hmm. And he's using a lot of imagery here to define that. Once you see him in the air, it says he they're sounding trumpets, which was something this culture would have understood any time the king or a high official came down the street in a procession there would be people going before them blowing trumpets. Mm -hmm. Ben Hur has a very good rendition of that. And Ben Hur has about all the Bible in it in one movie. If you watch that movie you'll understand it all. Yeah. Just okay. about. Sure. <laughs> um, about the Roman Empire, about the governmental system, mm -hmm. about uh, the blood of Jesus and how powerful it is. Uh, he said, He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds. That's a imaging, imaging, that's, that's imaging, all right. It's imagery to depict the fact that people that are Christ, that know him as Lord and Savior, no matter where they might be, mm -hmm. if they happen to be on earth at that time, there might be a few that get through the tribulation and know Christ as Lord and Savior. We know that there are. We know there's an evangelizing angel that's going to fly over the earth speaking uh, the words of words uh, about Jesus. We know there's going to be 144,000 evangelists coming out of the 12 tribes of Israel that are going to be spreading across the word, the world, speak, speaking about Jesus and winning people to Christ. But whether they be here or they be in heaven or they be anywhere else, it says no matter where you look and which direction you go, they're going to be brought together with Jesus. Mm -hmm. and we see this in 1 Thessalonians, which I'm going to turn to and have you read in just a few minutes. Um, then he says, how are you going to know this? They're going to come in from the four winds of the earth, from one end of heaven to the other. The angels are going to gather them up. Uh, we're all going to come together to see him in the air. And then he says, let me give you a little sign here. When you look out in the spring and you see the dogwood blooming, what does that tell you? Spring's coming. Summer's coming, right? Yeah, yeah. Dogwood mm -hmm. blooming means no matter how cool it is, not very warm out there today. No. 50s, 
Uh, sun's not shining, but the dogwood's blooming right mm -hmm. over here behind the house. What's that tell me? Warm weather's coming. Yes. It's about time to put corn in the ground. Mm -hmm. And he's doing the same thing here with the fig leaf. He says, when you see this fig leaf send out leaves, you know fig that... Tree. Excuse me? Fig, fig tree, tree, I mean. This fig tree sent out its branches and its buds. Uh, you know that uh, leaves are coming on, and that's an indication because God has set things in a pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He set it in a pattern. We go around each year, seasonal, in this part of the world. Uh, we're in the temperate zone, as Israel is, and every year we have a spring, a summer, a fall, and winter. Mm -hmm. And there are things that show us that, that we can use as a predictor. For us, that dogwood blooming means summer's coming. Yes. For them, the fig leaf sprouting means summer's coming. So what do you think he's, he's using this imagery for? Why, why would he just pull this out of the blue to, I don't, I don't, I don't quite understand. That's, I'm well, saying that tongue in cheek. Okay, tongue okay, cheek. okay. <laughs> well, when you see, um, these all these different events happening it means that there is a big event going to occur yeah, it's from the dawn of time yeah we've had this right and, yes sun's been set in the sky to give light for the day moon to give light for the night stars in their position um god has set a pattern up and and it operates in and of itself using physics and biology and all of those things to function and he is just using something that is natural that you would anybody could see and say when you see these things I'm talking about here it's just like if you're going out there the back door and you see the dogwood in bloom just like you go out and see the dogwood and dogwood in bloom summer's coming except for those days it's going to frost next week yeah unfortunately <laughs> ruin my garden probably um they have the similar circumstances mm -hmm. When you see these signs, pestilences, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, boy, have we not seen those signs now? Mm -hmm. I'm sure different times in history people would think the same thing, but nobody knows. Nobody We're knows. to be in a state of expectancy. Now, I'll turn to Philippians, Brenda, chapter 2, and read verse 10. And keep your thumb there in 1 Thessalonians, because we're going to go to chapter 4. But... Uh, General Electric Power Company, Philippians 2.10, and then we're going to slip over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Now immediately when this time comes that Jesus is going to return, everything is going to bow their knee to Jesus, whether they know him or not. Demons, devils, creation, everything in the air, everything under the earth, it doesn't matter what it is. Mm -hmm. The Creator is coming, and you're going to bow down to Him. Remember what the Apostle John said, nothing was created that was created that was not created by Him. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be a, a movement of nature, a movement of mankind, animal kingdom, everything is going to bow their knee to Jesus. Uh, the creator of the universe is going to receive the worship and adoration that he deserves. And then if you would, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And um, let's read, uh, start in there about verse 14 and read down through about 20. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, it's not um, my purpose here today in this lesson, nor as a lesson writer led us in that direction to talk about all of the, event, the events of Christ's second coming. 
But Christ is going to come in the harpazo, or what we call the rapture, uh, to take out the church. And that's when the angels are going to gather everyone that is part of God's elect and remove them. There will then be a seven-year period of tribulation in which the Antichrist um, basically takes over the world. There's going to be great tribulation, trials, troubles. Two-thirds of the, or not two-thirds, but three-fifths of the population of the earth will be destroyed. Um, at the end of that particular period of time, Christ shall come in His glory. That is when He's going to set His foot on the Mount of Olives. That is when every knee is going to bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is when He is going to set up His millennial thousand-year reign on the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. And all of Satan, all of his demons, all of evil is going to be wiped out. A battle of Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And Christ is going to do it with... Speaking out the word. Spoken word. The Bible mm -hmm. says they'll be dissolved asunder. Now, there are two times when uh, God overcomes evil in this world. The first time is in His second coming to set up the millennial reign. But during the millennial reign, there's going to be human beings born. There's not going to be anybody die. Uh, doctors, dentists, nurses are going to be out of business. Veterinarians are going to have a lot to do because we got to raise these livestock and have all the sacrifices in the temple in order to prove there's a price for sin. And God holds veterinarians in very high esteem anyway because we're husbandermen. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a whole lot to do. Okay. We're plenty busy. Those people that are born in the millennial reign are not going to really ever know Christ outside of Him sitting on the throne. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that God releases Satan for a little while and He is able to take many of these people that are born in that time and raise up a huge army against Christ. In that instance, God destroys them. God the Father destroys them. And in the second coming of Christ, Christ speaks the word which comes out like a two-edged sword and all of Satan, all his armies. Now after this end of this battle, at the thousand-year reign, God is going to bind Satan forever and ever and ever. He's not ever going to let him go. But I think he let him go at the end of that thousand-year reign just so these people could make a decision for Christ like their parents did, like mm -hmm. we did. Mm -hmm. The end result is that then we get a new heaven and a new earth. Mm -hmm. Then everything is going to be made new. So Christ actually has two second comings, one in the air to take out the church in the harpazo or the rapture and remove us so that we're not part of this seven-year tribulation, and then at the end of the seven-year tribulation, when he comes in his power and glory and sets his foot down on the Mount Olives, and it splits in two, and he puts his, and he takes up this throne of David that shall never die, and sets up his millennial reign. Lots of things taking place there. I think the real premise of what we want to do is what we're going to find in Matthew 24, 42 through 44, please. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the householder had known in what watch the thief would come, he would not have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. He would have watched and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore be you also ready, for in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh, now, in reality, Christ didn't give his disciples much, uh, a whole lot of information. He's given them all the information about what's going to happen and how to look forward to it. But he doesn't say, well, I'm going to come a thousand years from now, two thousand years from now, on a Sunday afternoon, it's bright and sunshiny. Or, I mean, what's he say? No man knows. Watch and pray. Yeah, pay attention. Watch and pray. So why do you think he chose to do that rather than be like Daniel who could calculate back and Christ could say when he came into Jerusalem on the day of the Mount of, all of um, Palm Sunday and say you should have known the day of your visitation. Calculated up to the exact day. Mm -hmm. How come we can't get that out of this deal? Um, because the purpose of our lives here is to live like Christ every day as if he could come any day. And uh, if, you, if you know the date, 
if he were to put in, here's here's the exact yeah. time I'm coming. September 6, 19, whatever. So you would you would spend most of your life just doing what you want to do. And then it's, oh man, the date's coming. I better straighten up. We're to be prepared on a daily basis. Yep. And doing his work on a daily basis. Prophecy was fulfilled in Christ's birth, death, burial, and resurrection mm -hmm. to the T. Mm -hmm. Exactly predicted to the T. Um, but his second coming for the church, the Harpazo, which you read in First Thessalonians chapter 4, the rapture, and then his second coming, which we would read in Revelation 21. Let's turn over there and read just a few scriptures in there in 20 and 21, Brenda. Um, hopefully today I won't add a chapter to Revelation and risk the curse of God on me like I have before. Uh, Verse uh, 19, excuse me, chapter 19, verse 11. I'm going to read it. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head, on his head were many crowns many awards. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dripped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp two-edged sword, and with it he shall smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is Christ coming in his power and his glory uh, to establish his millennial reign. He is going to destroy evil. He is going to put Satan and the beast and they're all going to be bound up for a thousand years until they're released for that short period of time. In this case, he is going to speak the Word of God, and all these men that are following Satan, all of them are just going to die, period. Blood's going to run bridle deep, it says, through the Valley of Armageddon when he's done. Don't believe that Christ is a pacifist. Mm -hmm. He is not a pacifist. He is a righteous judge. And then at the end of this thousand-year reign, if you go back here and read a little bit further into Revelation, you'll find that uh, it is God that does the judgment and brings about um, the destruction. And the devil, I'm looking here in uh, 20, the last part of 20, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast on the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, Back up to 9. And they went out on the breath of the earth and compassed, means surrounded, the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them like Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to be bound. The beast, the Antichrist, uh, all that are going to be bound in heaven forever. Or not in heaven. They're going to be bound in hell forever. And then comes the great white throne judgment, which is the judgment of the dead. Our judgment is called the judgment of the air, judgment in the air. Uh, our judgment is in Christ the moment we take Him as Lord and Savior. But we're going to be judged for what we did or did not do for Christ in this judgment of the air, this time of the harpazo, the time of the rapture. And that's where we are going to be rewarded for things that we did or for Christ. We're mm -hmm. going to get gold and silver and precious stones. Those things that we did not do, um, they're going to be hay, wood, and stubble. And when we get to heaven, these awards we don't keep. We don't strut around heaven and say, you could probably strut around heaven and make me feel like a dadgum heel up there because I'm not going to have near as much as you are. <laughs> I but doubt that. It doesn't happen, does it? No. No. The fourth chapter of Revelation says that we cast our crowns at the feet of Jesus. Mm -hmm. They are given to us because of what we did for Him, and we give them back to Him, and we cry, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, 
thou art worthy. Mm -hmm. This end of times is a fascinating subject, and it's very easy for people to get really confused. Christ came first to the earth on Christmas night. He came as a suffering servant. He came as a little baby born in a stable, laid in a feed trough. Mm -hmm. When he comes back the second time in his glory and touches that foot on Mount of Olives and it splits in two, he's going to come with all power and all glory. He's going to come, well, beyond your comprehension as the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing was created that was created that was not created by him, and he's going to rule with a rod of iron, and he's going to divide asunder with a two-edged sword. Mm -hmm. And we're going to rule with him. Mm -hmm. We're going to come with him. This army out of heaven, uh, symbolically clothed in white, because we are white once the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. Not because of what we did, not because of how good a person we were, or how strong a Christian we were, or how many gifts we had, or what all we did. Uh, we're going to give all that back to Jesus anyway. We come clothed in white linen because of what Christ did on the cross. His blood makes us justified before God. Well, I hope we haven't totally confused you this morning about the end times. I think the main thing that we're to remember out of all this, um, we're to be ready all the time. What did he tell his disciples, Brenda? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. That's to be our attitude. Thank you very much. See you next week.